Salutations, people. Welcome to Page 3 Killers, Murders That Went Unnoticed, a podcast where we dive into the murder cases that went unnoticed by our nation's newspapers. Hi, Shay. Hi, John. Hello, everyone. Hi, guys. Welcome back. Welcome to Page 3 Killers, Murders That Went Unnoticed, episode 49. Yes, episode 49. I can't believe we're almost done. Oh my gosh! And now I gotta. As soon as we start finish with this season, I have to start on next next season's uh, scripts. So, <laughs> all the research and everything. So, if any of you guys out there have any cases you want us to talk about next season, uh, we will be coming back late January, early February. Uh, we will start posting up new episodes. We're gonna take a couple weeks off, uh, get some episodes recorded. Um, and hopefully uh, get some good content for you guys. Right, babe? Hopefully. Yeah. And this week we have a really good case. Uh comes out of England. I saw this um, just I was researching for um, another episode that we did in England. Uh, I think it was the the one with the woman that was found dead in the in the train. Uh, Mary Money. Dead in the train. Uh, it was like the train tunnel. I don't remember this. <laughs> she, like, did we the, do it yet? Yeah, we already did it. And it was suspected that possibly her brother did it um, because it, he then murdered um, his lover, her, her sister or whatever, because he was he was banging both sisters. Yeah, I don't remember. Yeah. Well, I found this while I was uh, investigating that case, and it seemed kind of interesting. This is an unsolved um, murder from 1946. So it's super interesting. Um, And there was a a couple of suspects. So we're going to, I think you guys are going to like it. So this week we're going to be talking about um, mural drink water. It's an interesting. Like, well, it's a very, very English last name. Yes, and I believe this one comes out of. I know it's out of the out of the United Kingdom. I think it takes place in Wales. I'm pretty sure it's located in Wales, um, which is part of the United Kingdom. But you know, shout out to our our British fans out there that listen, because uh, somebody did point out <laughs> that she she was surprised that I knew that Wales was. Like a separate. Because you're American and we don't know anything (laughs) about anything other than America. Yeah. Well, I I said uh, I'm a big Doctor Who fan. So, I mean, Cardiff, come on. It's in Wales. (laughs) So, we're going to get right into our news. Oh, wait. We didn't do our patrons. Shout out time. Yeah. Shout out to uh, Chelsea and Rolok. Uh, thank you uh, for donating on Patreon. We appreciate you guys so much. And if you, too, want to become a supporter of Page 3 Killers, you can just hit us up. Uh, the link's in our bio. And uh, join us. Support your podcast for as little as a dollar a month. So there we go. Now we'll roll into our news. <laughs> so, ni- I, like I said, this takes place at 1946. So we had uh, quite a few interesting things happen in 1946. So we're we're a few years outside of World War One or World War Two. Mm-hmm. Yep. So we have on the fifth of March, Winston Churchill delivers his Iron Curtain speech at the Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri, United States. Yep. So anyone who's not familiar. Is where he uh, basically drew a line down, right down the middle of Europe, and said that uh, Russia, you don't get to come any further west. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. There you go. The next one that I have on here uh, is March 9th. We have the Burden, uh, Burden Park disaster, uh, which was a stadium disaster at the Bolton Wanderers uh, Stadium. Uh, the FC Bird, Burnden Park in Bolton. Uh, 
33 people were killed uh, in like a trampling incident. So I re I was just reading up a little bit on this, and there apparently what happened was that they had way more people in attendance than they had space for, um, and they believed that the crowd was around 85,000 people there. It was insane, um, and caused people to get trampled to death. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is, it's British football, so. Yeah. They're passionate. Yes, they are. Now, on March 15th, we have a Labor uh, Prime Minister Clement Attlee uh, uh, announces that Britain is granting India's wish for independence. So, on March 24th uh, of 1946, the Cabinet uh, mission to India arrived in New Delhi for discussions. Not sponsored, but, um, what is it not? Oh, I can't remember the name of the YouTube channel. Someone does a really good animated version of this. It's like four or five episodes long really? of hmm. the weird colonial history of India. Yeah. It is. It's, it's a very unique situation in history. Well, last week, I Extra think. Extra credit is the name of the. Oh, okay. Yeah. Shout Extra out. credit history. <laughs> Yeah, as you guys know, John is the specialist on a lot of history stuff um, and some other things, including cars and just stuff. Gun weapon random, expert. <laughs> random stuff. Random, random stuff expert. So usually if I don't know about it, he does. Right? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Now, on June 8th, uh, we have a victory parade is held in London to celebrate the end of World War II. Yay. Yay. Yep. Now, for the U.S., the, the big things in the United States that we had happen. So, on May 21st, uh, the Manhattan Project uh, physicist, uh, Dr. Louis Slalton, uh Accidentally triggers a fusion reaction. Fusion at... reaction. Yeah, that's what I said. No, you said fusion. It's fission. Fission. Okay, sorry. Fission reaction uh, at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. And although saving his co-workers gives himself a lethal, a lethal dose of hard radiation, making him the second victim of a... Uh, criticality incident oh my gosh i don't know why i like looked at it and i'm like i can't read today <laughs> so this is uh actually kind of famous i learned yeah. about this one i believe he literally just dropped a uh like a hunk of uranium and the the hunk of uranium kind of from the impact caused wow caused uh, an issue. I'm not sure if this is the exact situation. I know something similar to that happened. And the guy basically just jumped on top of it instead of giving everybody a bunch of radiation. It's basically, it was basically like falling on top of a grenade. Yeah. Okay. So I'm guessing he didn't sur he didn't live much longer after that. No, and it's a terrible way to go. Yeah. It literally, it, your cells, your, the atoms in your cells and we start exploding that's insane like i i've seen i mean exploding is not the real word i've but. seen dramatization of you know people dying of uranium poisoning like uh, of radiation poisoning um and i've heard about it in several different espionage cases you know like russian uh, espionage agents and it's stuff like that. It's difficult to detect. Uh, yeah, and I'm just like, huh. Like, is the dramatization on TV the same? Like, are they close to what what it would look like? Probably like, not. Yeah, I my I like I always feel like it should look a lot worse than it does. I mean, it doesn't really look bad. It's just, it's a weird way to go. Put it that way. Yeah. 
your body literally it just starts ripping itself apart Oof. on like an atomic level it's kind of it's crazy mm. sounds painful sounds mm. very painful yeah yeah so we're <laughs> We're going to move on since I've exhausted that one. Uh, now, on August 1st, uh, we have President Truman signs the Atomic Energy Act of 1946, which establishes the United States Atomic Energy Commission. Uh, it was all thanks to Admiral Rickover. Yeah. He, he was basically the person who looked at the atomic bomb and went, we can use that. And yeah, right. and turn it into a system. Like a, uh, 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 he could harness. Well, he figured he could harness the energy, hmm. and within a decade, I believe they had it figured out. Uh, had I mean, sure, you can you can say it was figured out. They sort they solved the, the question very quickly. Ah, they knew they they knew there was something there. It was whether or not they could control it. Okay. Now, on December fifth, uh, we have President Truman establishes the President's Committee on Civil Rights to investigate the status uh, the status of civil rights in the United States, and proposes the measures uh, to strengthen and protect the civil rights of American citizens. It pissed a lot of people off. Yeah. And then on December seventh. We have a fire at the Wincroft Hotel in Atlanta, Georgia, that kills 119 people. That seems like a lot. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was old and... Uh, not sprinkler. Not, not, yeah, not sprinkler. Not designed, um, you know, with a excess, uh, fire-rated ex <laughs> like exits. Um accessible routes through the building so it's yeah. not designed for fire egress yeah fire egress yeah that's what i was trying to say <laughs> now we're going to move into our cd side so we have january 4th theodore church uh is hanged at hm uh well her majesty's prison uh paytonville uh by albert Pierre Point, the only British soldier executed for treachery committed during World War II and the last person to be executed in Britain for an offense other than murder. I wonder what, what I need to look up what this guy did. Yeah. I don't have my phone on me, so. I figured he would make a, a good uh, side, side episode, maybe. Now, the next one we have is the November 9th shooting of Margaret Cook at uh, Carnaby Street, London. Now, Margaret Cook was a woman who was shot dead on November 9th, uh, 1946, outside of the Blue Lagoon nightclub in London. Uh, in 2005, a man living in Canada confessed the shooting, which uh, would make this the longest gap between a crime and a confession in British history. 70 years later. Yeah. Jesus. Like on, I guess he was on his deathbed. I don't know. Now, in the U.S., we had a bunch of things going on. But the three most famous, okay? So, we had, on February 12th, uh, Isaac Woodard, a an African-American soul army veteran, uh, what is beaten and blinded by police chief... Uh, Lin Linwood Shaw in Battensburg, South Carolina, uh, an event which is brought to a national attention in Orson Welles radio show. Yeah. Now on uh, May 2nd, we have six inmates successfully tried to escape from Alcatraz, a uh, federal penitentiary in San Francisco Bay. A riot occurs, uh, and it is dubbed the Battle of Alcatraz. I didn't realize that was a federal penitentiary. Yeah. I mean, I would I would like to go visit Alcatraz at some point. Like, I don't know. I think it would be kind of cool. Have you ever thought about going there before? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. It's like an interesting... Like, I mean, if you're in California, you might as well. I mean, or you, you can just watch The Rock. That's true. 
I mean, I feel... Uh, Which okay. I probably wasn't filmed at Alcatraz. So, we have here in, in, uh, in Philadelphia, we have the Eastern State Penitentiary. Which housed Al Capone. Al Capone in his like final years or fi- fi- like final. How long did he live in there? Uh, was, I was like, there. I was there a while. Yeah, he was there for a while. So I, I would think it was his final years um, before he died. Uh, which history wise is it's a pretty interesting place. I put it on the same level as Alcatraz. The only thing that sucks is there is a lot more funding into Alcatraz, like, maintaining it and stuff for visit- visitors, whereas Eastern State Penitentiary, yeah, they have visitors in, but there's, like, whole sections that are, like, collapsed. Like, it's it's kind of, like, just falling apart. And it's a shame because it's a really interesting uh, place to go look at. I think it was the... Uh, one of the first prisons that had like two so it had multiple wings on it and it housed both male and female prisoners on the same premises sounds like a terrible idea yeah they were in totally different wings though they had uh one wing that was just women and then there they had like a wing that was solitary and then they had like one that was just like men and it was really interesting that that prison's how it's laid out and everything. It's pretty cool. And so our final one, we have the 1946 Georgia lynchings, uh, and this is a uh, a mass lynching in the United States. A mob of white men uh, shoot and kill two African American couples near Moore's uh, Ford Bridge in Georgia. Yeah. I guess is just in time for that uh that civil rights act. Yeah. And that, I know I did we oh, I'm not sure if you watched it with me the other night. I just watched a really good um I didn't watch it with you. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> no, what was it? I don't know. Uh, I watched this this movie. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name off of the top of my head and I I just was not prepared to like talk about that. Who was um, in it? Oh my gosh! You remember? It it was the oh goodness. So it was about the school integration down south, uh, where to allow um, African American students. Into oh, I know what you're talking about. And it's about the the guy who what he was a Klansman. He was in the KKK, um, and they are have to do this, uh, this week long talk out, like basically like learn about you know each other and all that, and it changes his mind and like he has to he ends up voting to integrate the schools and tearing up his his membership card to the to the clan. Is it a real story? Yeah, it's a real story. And he became friends with uh, with a woman that he considered to be like his, uh, like he would never be friends with before that. And it was kind of crazy. Um, his he was like uh, C P C P Jones or something like that, and uh, and her name was like Alice Atwood or something. Yeah, I think I know which movie you're talking. I can't remember the name yeah. of it. Oh my god, it was such a good film. It was a really good film. Uh, and it it moved really, really well. And I, if I remember by the time, by the end of this show, guys, I will tell you guys the name. If not, I will put it in a link in the bio or something to like the trailer. But it was a really good film. You guys should check it out. So now we're going to move into our case. Because we're right on schedule. <laughs> so we're going to move into the case. So just a little background on this case. So Meryl uh, Joan Drinkwater was born on July 19th of 1933 in Carmeth? Carmethan? Carmarthen. Carmarthen? Uh, in Carmarthenshire, 
Oh, sure. whales. Oh, my gosh. Whales. Yes. Now, in 1946, she was 12 years old. I have no idea. <laughs> there, there was, like, Swansea. Pendler, pendler gear. Pen, pendler Swansea. Gear. Swansea whales. Um, so, I, I'm... That's where she was living at the time uh, of her death. Wales, you need to start speaking English. <laughs> That's kind of rude. Um, they were they they speak their own. They have their own language and all that. Um, so yeah. Now Meryl Drinkwater uh, was the youngest of four daughters, born uh, to her parents, a uh, John Percival and Margaret at uh, Drinkwater. Now. Mural uh, was known locally as the Little Nightingale because uh, she had a beautiful singing voice. So she was well known in her area. Now, on the day of her murder, which was on, Ju on uh, June 27th, 1946, she took the school bus from home, uh, took the school bus home from her grammar school, which was... Gowerton, I'm going to say... Gowerton, Gowerton. Gowerton. She was last seen at 2.30 p.m. singing as she headed for the one-mile walk to her family's home from Taldu Ty Ty Farm. I was stuck behind a bus the other day. Yeah. And this bus stopped every 100 feet <laughs> to pick up a child. That's... Uh, there were sidewalks in between. Um, it was, I was ready to, to just start screaming because how mm. I, I, I don't understand. Kids can't walk a hundred feet anymore. Yeah. There should have been one bus stop. It was like a very large apartment complex. One yeah. bus stop for all the kids. I'll give them two, one for one side and one for the other. Yeah. But no, these kids couldn't walk a hundred feet. This bus stopped on a major road. That's crazy. Like six times. Just losing my damn mind. Yeah. Well, I'm assuming like this is more like you know they they have an area they're like okay all the kids that live in this area you get off at one stop, and then you drive up to the next sec, like next section drop them all off. Now the path she walked home curved uh, in and out of the woods, and the areas that curved out. Her mother could see her through her kitchen window. And her mother said that, you know, she had seen her coming up. Uh, she had waved to her uh, as her mother was at the kitchen window. Uh, her mother saw her walk along the path and saw her enter the woods, but she did not see her come back out. Now, the last person who reported seeing her was Herbert Hoyles, uh, who was 13. Now, he passed her on the path going the opposite direction. Now, he was returning home from her farm, from her family's farm, where he had been sent to buy eggs. Her mother later went to, into the village uh, to look for her when she did not return home. Now, more than a dozen men from the area began to search uh, around her home and the woods and everything uh, as soon as they realized that she was missing. Now, the next day, uh, her body was found in the woods by a police inspector. They, uh, they found that she had been raped, bludgeoned, and then shot twice in the chest. Now, evidence shows that she was shot after being sexually assaulted. Now, police believed... Uh, she was pulled from the path into the woodland and then attacked. So it looked like there was like drag marks on the ground where she was like dragged off of the road. Now, her death was dubbed uh, the Little Red Riding Hood murder, which uh, seems really interesting. Now, two days later, uh, police found one of the murder weapons which was a World War One era Colt forty five. Is that a, a common gun, babe, or 
For World War One, yeah, it's probably a uh, mm. cult single action army. Mm-hmm. Although it's it's a single action, so shooting someone twice is yeah. You this is not um we're not on the seat with Alec Baldwin. These guns, which by the way was the same gun, um these these guns don't shoot themselves. Yeah. So there ha- there's like intent kind of thing. Uh, it's a well, I mean, after after someone bludgeons someone's and a twelve year old girl and then rapes them. Yeah. You know, shooting them's not not too far out of the intent question. Uh but yeah, it requires you to cock the hammer and then pull the trigger. Okay. I mean so I guess you, so it could you have, have a, to do two two functions to two functions. Okay. I it could be it could have been a navy, which I believe were double action at the time. Interesting. But which is weird because it's England. You think it'd be a Webley Fosbury or something, but well, I don't know. I mean, they did have Americans stationed there um, during World War One. I. I mean, it was also. I mean, it's also a at the time a twenty year old pistol. Yeah. So, so you you like make trades, I guess, between soldiers to to soldier. Who knows? You know, you get drinking well, one night and you make friends with a British guy, and then you guys trade trade weapons as a souvenir. Yeah, it, well, kind the thing, thing is, it's you know? yeah, it's kind of weird to see forty five over in England. That's I all. wonder what the uh, what Europe the was a common thing smaller calibers. They they like smaller caliber. Okay. Yeah, it was more gentlemanly. Ah. Um, and then World War One happened, and people are like, "Uh, we need stuff that just shoots people really, really good." <laughs> and they're just like, "Oh, you know what? America's kind of got a corner on that." <laughs> So, well, yeah. nah, everyone switched over to a German round. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. The, the Luger. The Luger. Oh, yeah. Except for America. We stayed with 45s. Anyway, let's move on. Yep. So we have the Glamorgan. Glamor- Galmorgan. Morgan. Police uh, assisted by the 169th Bomb Disposal Unit. Uh, use a metal detector to search for a second uh, second weapon. Suspecting, uh, suspected that it to have been used, but never they never located a second weapon. I'm assuming they're looking for the bludgeoning object. Yeah, um, or possibly another gun. Uh, they did not specify in the articles that I had. I assume that it is the the bludgeoning weapon. Now, detectives from Scotland Yard came to Swansea to assist. In the investigation of uh, of her murder, the police visited every house within 150 square miles and interviewed over 20,000 men in Swansea and neighboring Aberdeer uh, in Carmarthenshire. Is it Sheer or Shar? Sheer. I think it's Sheer. Shar. I, I'm confused already. <laughs> now, more than 3,000 uh, people turned out uh, to mourn um, Meryl Drinkwater's death uh, at her funeral on July 2nd. She was buried at the St. David's Church. Uh, a description of a person of interest was circulated uh, following uh, her funeral. Uh, he was described as approximately 30 years old with thick, fluffy hair wearing a brown corduroy trouser and light brown sports coat. Now, police also circulated photos of an American uh, Army-issued gun uh, that they thought might have been used as a murder Uh, weapon. So it was an American-issued gun. And I I believe it was the Colt New Army, not the single-action army. So it would have been double-action. Yeah. Okay. So... Okay, so they believe that the weapon had uh, been uh, modernized uh, and had uh, the wooden stock next to the grip. They had uh, modernized the the, the suspect type. Okay, so basically plastic, they were not wooden grips anymore. They were uh, purse back, which I'm assuming is some type of plastic. Yeah, had been used to modernize the original wooden stock uh, next to uh, the grip. So, yeah. 
I was going to, so I made it a note to ask you what kind of gun. <laughs> yeah, it's almost assuredly, now I'm thinking about it, it's almost assuredly a, a cult new army. Yeah. So it was believed a similar weapon had been used in the murder of a cinema manager in Bristol. Not Bristol here. I Bristol. understand, yeah, we live right next to, there's like 12 Bristols in America, because yeah. they're all named after the, the one. Yeah. Now, in, in August, uh, the police appealed to the United States public for assistance as many Americans had been stationed in that area during the recent uh, Second World War. They believed one of these American servicemen may have sold the weapon to their possible perpetrator. So they reached out. Honestly, I don't think there was much. That's much came never. Of that. gonna, yeah. That's nobody's, never going to work. Yeah. There's just, it's ne not going to make it far enough in the United States. Maybe it'll hit the East Coast, but I doubt that would make it to the West Coast. So. No, no, they were seeing if the gun was sold by an American to the. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were, was, they were seeing if it was supplied by an American. Yeah. What are you talking about to the West Coast? No, like, uh, so. They they sent out like a media appeal for you know to see. Oh, if I figured any... they just talked to people in the army and were like, "Hey, ask your guys." Of course, no one would admit to it because it's selling government property. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, that's what I'm saying. We could just go nowhere. Hey, did any one of your guys break the law and, and sell some one of their government issued guns? No one's going to admit to that. Now, in 2003, uh, detectives did reopen this case. So after, what, like 60-some oh, years? In 1946. So 57 2003, years. Yeah, 57 years. Detectives reopened the case, uh, and they hoped to use DNA technology, which, you know, had advanced quite a bit um, since, like, the 80s. So they open that case back up and they take a look at the gun that they did find. Now, unfortunately, there was they were uh, not successful as too many people had handled the gun after it was collected. So they couldn't get anything um, pretty much on that. So that seemed like a lost cause right there. Now, it was believed that the victim's clothes had been lost, but a team in 2008, um, headed up by a retired detective uh, investigating cold cases, found uh, her clothes in storage in one of their facilities. Uh, and that was retired DCI Bethels. Uh, and I have a quote uh, from the article that I read. I found the original clothing and we know even though it had been 60 years since it was it went into storage that it was hers her name was written in in copper plate Merrill J Drinkwater and they were examined by the forensic expert who did some incredible work for us and was able to find the full crime, uh, crime, crime stain on the back of Merrill's uh, little school Mac. We know 100% that it is the killer's stain. There is no date, doubt about it. So I'm guessing that it was like a semen sample. Now the items were tested. Uh, and that the items that were tested were her blue coat her underwear, and her school uniform. Now, all the evidence had been wrapped in paper bags uh, and stored. Now, on the back of the coat, uh, there was a no longer visible uh, semen stain, which was circled with yellow crayon. Now, scientists successfully retrieved DNA, a DNA profile from this strain. Uh, the coat had been lying basically forgotten in the police storage for decades. Uh, and they thought that it might not be uh, viable, but it, you know, they were able to pull that, um, the DNA sequence from it. And it is uh, 
one of the oldest pieces of crime scene evidence in the world. That can't be true. I guess viable crime scene evidence. I mean, here in the United States, we have a lot of cases that, like, died. Like, they just didn't go anywhere because, I mean, by the time How they... old's the boy in the box? Oh, my gosh. Um... That was only from the 50s, right? Yeah. Yeah, never mind. That's a really famous Philadelphia case, the boy in the box. Yeah. I- I've seen quite a few things on that um, for you guys uh, in the UK and overseas. You guys might not have heard it. That one's, it was a little boy found in a refrigerator box, like a cardboard box for a refrigerator. Wasn't that just solved? I don't think so, no. I thought they solved it. No. And uh, he, nobody reported a kid missing. So they... No, they identified the kid. That's right. They did. They recently... I, within the past few years, they identified the kid. Wow, that's crazy. I wonder who... I, I've never seen... I didn't see anything about that. Yeah, I remember that. I mean, it might have been like five or six years ago. But I do remember that. Yeah. So, uh, they... Like I said, they pulled that DNA sequence. Uh, they had a familial DNA profile... Uh, which was extracted using a technique called y- Y-S-T-R, Y-S-T-R. But a no match was found in the national DNA database that they have. Uh, Herbert Hoyles, uh, who saw uh, drink, uh, Meryl drink water after buying eggs at her parents' farm, was cleared by the DNA evidence. He stated that he had long been suspected by some locals of being the murderer and was happy to clear his name. That's got to be a crappy situation. Yeah, for like 60 years, you're just no, the number one suspect up until 2008. Like, that's crazy. Now, during the investigation, uh, even Merrill's uh, father, John, was a suspect. Now, her parents were regular churchgoers, and following the death of their daughter, uh, they basically stopped going to church. And within two years of her death, they had moved away from the farm. Detectives were able to track down uh, a relative of hers named Martin Phelps. Now, Martin was six at the time of her death. Now, he agreed to give a DNA sample that could rule out her father uh, to uh to the investigators as a, you know, possible suspect. The results of that test have never been made public. Now, in 2009, a Walsh police, uh, Welsh police began uh, reinvestigating any links uh, with the murder of 11-year-old Sheila Martin, which is a... A, a similar case that happened about 250 miles away from from there. So Sheila Martin was raped and strangled in the Sun Hill Wood in Falkham Glen, Kent on the 7th of July, 1946, uh, in the same year. This was 10, uh, 10 days after uh, Merrill's murder. Both girls were murdered in woods within a half mile of their home. Now, the South Wales police detectives requested the original case file from the Kent office uh, police to determine if there was any connection. Now, Harold Jones, uh, he is a possible suspect uh, in in the murder of both Sheila and Meryl Drinkwater. So Neil Melkins, a Welsh true crime author, theorized the notorious child murderer Harold Jones, who uh, passed away in 1971 as the one responsible for both murders. Now Harold Jones was born on January 11th, 1906. In 1921, at 15 years old, he killed two, uh, two... Predolescent. Predolescent. 
<laughs> girls in Monmouthshire, Shire, uh, Wales. Harold Jones was acquitted for the murder of his first victim, which was eight-year-old Frida Burnell. Now, she was killed on the 21st of June in 1921. 17 days later, he murdered uh, an 11-year-old neighbor named Florence Little. Now, Jones pled guilty to Florence Little's murder and also confessed to of murdering uh, Frida Burnell uh, at his second trial. Owing to his being under 16 at the time he committed the murder, uh, Jones escaped uh, the capital punishment for his crime. Uh, he was sentenced to be detained at Her Majesty's pleasure on the 1st of November, 1921, and he was released from prison in 1941. He later married uh, and ha did have ch uh, child with uh, his wife. He died of bone cancer in 1971 at the age of 64. Now, however, in 2019, South Wales police uh, started uh, stated that forensic tests on the DNA categorically confirmed that he was not responsible for the murder of Merrill Drinkwater. So he just wasted all of her time going through all of his history. Well, he's a he was a possible suspect. Mm. So Remember this Neil Milkins person news. You were wrong. Yeah. <laughs> now we're going to talk about our our next suspect, which would be Rodney uh Ronnie Harris. Now, a team of former detectives and crime experts have reinvestigated the case and have uncovered a new prime suspect. After reviewing the forensic evidence used by new, uh, using new forensic tests, the name of convicted murderer Rodney Harris is brought up as a possible suspect. He was the last man to have been hanged in Carmouth. Now, Rodney had been, uh, had been, uh, suggested as a possible suspect, um, he was hanged in 1954 for the double murder of his aunt and uncle. In, and that would be his uncle John and Phoebe Harris. He was 24 years old and, and he was basically like their adopted nephew of John Harris. In October of 1953, the neighbors of John and Phoebe noticed that they had a few unmilked cows in their field on their small farm, which was a, a very unusual occurrence for the 63-year-old uh, farmer. Uh, John Harris, he was, was known to be very diligent about caring for his animals um, on his farm and all that. So they, his neighbors got a little concerned. Now, Rodney Harris told people that his uncle and 54-year-old aunt had gone to London for a holiday and left him in charge of their farm. Uh, now, local police were not satisfied with his answers uh, that he gave them uh, and called in Scotland Yard. They discovered that a check made out to Ronald from his uncle had been altered from nine pounds to 909 pounds. Detectives suggested that Harris had disposed of his elderly relations, you know, for the, to basically get the money. Now, as the farm was very large, it was difficult to search manually. So they decided to basically spook Ronnie into, into basically tricking him into showing them where the bodies were hidden. Now, they took a cotton thread, so like sewing machine thread, and they ran it uh, around the property uh, in certain areas. And they just waited for him to, you know, go out and check on stuff. 
So they, they basically went across all the gates and gaps and hedges. And then they, you know, started making noise, uh, as much noise as possible to put uh, Ronnie on edge. The plan worked, so he left the house uh, and went out to check around the yard and led police uh, right to the burial site, which was still intact. Uh, and he, in doing so, he broke one of the threads, which was used as evidence that he, you know, knew where they were. Now, detectives checked the threads at dawn and found the broken thread and soon discovered uh, the grave of the couple. Their bodies were found buried uh, in a kale farm, in a kale field on the farm. It was found that the couple had been struck with a hammer, uh, killing them. Uh, Harris bludgeoned, to death, uh, bludgeoned them to death because they wouldn't let him borrow his car. Uh, his uncle wouldn't let him borrow their car. Basically. Which was a big deal back in the day. Yeah. So he basically confessed to that and he said, well, it was because they, they wouldn't let me drive their car. Which I think is a real stupid reason to kill somebody. Like. Now Harris was charged uh, with the double murder. Uh, in March of 1954, uh, Harris was put on trial. Uh, the circumstantial evidence was strong, and he was found guilty shortly after that. On April 28th of 1954, he was hanged at the Swansea prison. Uh, there is evidence that Harris was employed by Merrill Drinkwater's father, John, at the time of her death. Uh, which makes him a good candidate for, you know, I mean, he's, he's, he killed two of his relations afterwards. So I think he makes a good suspect. Um, I don't know if they, they were able to do like any DNA testing or if that's still something that they can do for him. I don't know. Now, public access uh, to the case. So basically in 2010... The Lord Chancellor Advisory Council on National Records and Archives closed off public access to the case, uh, acting at the behest of the Scotland Yard. Now, public uh, the public can no longer access the uh, the Drinkwater files uh, by Freedom of Information Act request uh, requests or in person at the archive office in. Q, K E W, uh, call. call. Now the reason given for sealing the files is that police could still possibly catch the perpetrator. Yeah. Mm, I think it's more likely that it's like a prince. <laughs> yeah, you you think it's the royal family. I don't know. I don't understand why they uh they would they would shut off public access so late in the the deal, um. Yeah. Uh, unless it was someone important that they were looking at. True. But yeah, so that's everything I was able to find on this case. I just thought it was like really interesting, like her, her murder in particular, how it happened within less than a mile of her home that like her mother literally saw her walk from you know down the street into the wooded area and then never saw her exit and I, I'm just like how did that kid not see anybody else like I just don't know There's, there seems to be something a little hanky going on there I don't know that's what I'm saying there's a reason why they shut it off. So that is it for this case. I know, we're a little light on the time, so I don't know. Maybe you got some filler. No. Got not really. not about. <laughs> well, next week will be our season finale for uh, Patriot Killer season one. 
So, uh, I got a pretty good one for next week. We got a, we got a serial killer for next week, um, that you guys might enjoy. Maybe. Yeah. Hopefully, I think everybody will. I, I enjoyed researching that one, and I'm starting to put together cases for next season, so I'm going to be working on that content, getting that stuff ready to go for, you know, our first couple episodes, and I think I, I, we might do the, the kiss and kill, kill, uh, the kiss and tell killer for our first case. Well, if anyone out there has any suggestions, hit us yeah. up. Yes, definitely. You can uh, message us, um, to send the email, email to Google, Facebook. Facebook. We also have, you can comment on the YouTube videos or comment on, which one do you seem to get comments for? Um. Podcast addicts. Well, yeah. I mean, I guess if you want to leave us a review. Yeah. And in your review, you could put down a uh, a case you want us to do. And we'll probably do it. Yeah. So once again, a shout out to our patrons. Thank you guys so much uh, for making, uh, you know, your donations. And we will see you guys back here next week at the same, same uh, normal time. <laughs> <laughs> what what is it that you that you're saying? I well I rip off Batman. <laughs> same bat time, same bat channel. Bat channel. <laughs> All right, guys, stay safe. Um, yeah, and lock your doors. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. Mm -hmm.